Welcome to Get Your Spirit in Shape, United Methodist Communications and UMC.org's podcast to help keep our souls as healthy as our bodies. I'm Joy Avino. It can be difficult today to have conversations about certain topics with friends, with family members, with members of our church, and certainly with the anonymous person on social media. I wanted to learn how we could disagree better. And so I chatted with the Reverend Bo Sanders, a United Methodist pastor and blogger and podcaster. Bo has a unique ministry at Vermont Hills United Methodist Church in Portland, Oregon. Rather than having a traditional Sunday morning sermon, Bo hosts conversations. And so I wanted to learn for him how we can disagree better. In our talk, Bo shares some tips and some tricks about how we can become better conversationalists by becoming better listeners, and how we need to stay at the table and learn to disagree well. Enjoy. So we are talking across the miles today with the Reverend Bo Sanders, the pastor of Vermont Hills United Methodist Church in Portland, Oregon. Bo, welcome to Get Your Spirit in Shape. Thank you. I am so honored to be here. I really appreciate the invite. And I'm really excited to to talk to you on the podcast because I want to learn from you how to have better, meaningful conversations with people with whom we don't necessarily agree. Because yes. at, a, at a time when it seems our ability to have those conversations is maybe at an all-time low, you are having these conversations as part of your worship services in your church. And so I'm, I'm curious to know, um, why should we be having these kinds of conversations? Wow, I hadn't really thought about how uh, dangerous and controversial that was until you framed it that way. So <laughs> now even I'm a little, <clears throat> a little paying attention. Um, so over the past 15 years, I have just become increasingly uh, convinced and passionate that interactive church is... Um, the way to go that in an age of social media and in, in, in an age like we live in where people, their contribution really matters in so many ways, whether it's at the PTA or in Facebook discussions or group of like book clubs, people are really used to their contribution um, adding to the collective experience. And then when they come to church, um, unfortunately, because we have set it up so often in a pre-scripted uh, manner, um, they really become spectators that watch a spectacle. And so I'm pretty passionate about trying to get people involved and, and conversation is the way that I have found um, that most people can enter in and that their participation and uh, adds to the collaborative process and that who is in the room begins to matter a lot. That's the first thing. Hmm. The second thing is that how we facilitate those conversations is really important because like you said, we live in such a contentious, uh, adversarial, polarized era that it is difficult um, and, you know, we hear about this all the time now. It is really difficult sometimes to even have family dinners right. or, um, or holidays or backyard barbecues without uh, these polarizing and controversial subjects dividing us. And, um, yeah, it's just become a real issue. So for me, facilitating these conversations as a sacred community and it, it performs two functions. One is it's us learning to listen to each other and to give validity to other people's perspectives and insights and experiences. And that's just a, a good practice to have uh, as a community. But the other thing is that it almost is a prophetic ministry to our uh, argument culture, as Deborah Tannen calls it, um, that we both invite different people into the conversation, but we also have practiced listening in a culture where it seems like the volume is turned up to 11 and people are yelling across to the aisle and you can't hear anybody. And so this, this is a, a prophetic posture of listening is a ministry to our culture of conflict. 
And what are some of the things that you're learning? How are people responding to this? And what are some of the fruit that you have seen born out of it? Well, for me, there is a humility that says I don't have all the answers. I don't have all the information. And even if I did, we, you and I might come to different conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so two of the things that I've really found very helpful, um, there's a guy named Peter Rollins, and he uh, has popularized this, the ideas of uh, this guy named Lacan. But one of the ideas that I have found the most helpful is called the experience of absence and the absence of experience. And so his ex one of the examples that um, people seem to really resonate with is if, if you and I were in a coffee shop together and we're, we're in the same place at the same time doing the same thing, the only difference is you're expecting a friend mm -hmm. who hasn't shown up yet and isn't answering their phone. I am not experiencing that person's absence. I'm having the absence of experience. I don't know anything's wrong. Sure. You are experiencing your friend's absence. So even though on the surface, you and I are in the same place doing the same thing at the same time, we are having two very different experiences. Once I had this kind of tool in my, in my brain, I started realizing that you could have 50, 60, 80 people at church and they're having 50, 60, 80 different experiences, even though we're all in the same place at the same time doing the same thing. So like, let's say if we sing a song, you know, if that song was sung at my mother's funeral, I'm experiencing that song very different, experiencing her absence. You have never heard that song before. And you're thinking, oh, this is a tough song to sing. And you're having an absence of that experience. Mm. And so you cannot assume that just because everybody's in the same room doing the same thing at the same time, that they're all do, you know, having the same experience. And once you are humbled by that, then you take a posture of this listening because you realize there is no way you can know what is happening inside somebody else. And so there's just a, it's a kind of a love mm. or a, a ministry that opens my heart to another to say, I'm not going to assume that you experienced this the same way I did. And so if you back that up out of the church experience and put it in our yeah. everyday life, how does that look when we're having that conversation across the dining room table with the uncle with whom we disagree? Yeah, it is really challenging. And so one of the exercises that I have begun doing is whenever a subject comes up that I'm, I'm pretty sure I understand, or at least I have a, a really strong opinion on, I've started asking myself, what if I'm wrong on this one? Hmm. What if I got this one wrong? And so I try and put myself in somebody else's shoes and think through, and right now, you know, uh, football's about to start up. And so we're going to, everyone's going to be arguing about uh, protests during the singing of the national anthem. And I have a really strong opinion about that issue, but, I say to myself about anything that I seem a little too sure on, especially the things that are really inflamed. I've, I've tried to develop the discipline to say, what if I'm wrong here? And to try and think through what the other person is seeing or feeling or what their conviction is rooted in that I'm missing. And part of that is just to understand that um, I want to humanize not demonize people that I disagree with. They're not bad people. They're not monsters. They're not demons. They're real human beings who just see this differently than I do. And so even though I'm a super opinionated person, I've tried to say, what if I'm wrong on this one? And it's, it's humbling to just try and think through or access um, other people's perspectives in a way that challenges my confidence and certainty that I'm right on this. And that ability to get inside the shoes of the other person really stretches you a little bit. Yeah, yeah. The, you know, if, for people who grew up in like debate club, mm -hmm. or maybe they've been a part of something, an exercise like that, one of the exercises that's really good is that you, you, as a discipline, you have to be able to articulate your opponent's position to their satisfaction before you make your own case. And that's just, I think, in our argument culture, I keep calling it that. Yeah. This book by Deborah Tannen was really 
um, powerful for me. And uh, especially the fact that she wrote it before things got this bad. So she wrote it in 98. And um, I mean, this is before 9-11 when uh, everything became uh, militarized. And it was before these last two presidencies that have been so divisive and controversial. So the fact that she wrote it sort of before the internet, before Facebook, you know, is really helpful to me to read something that she thought there was a big enough problem in 98, 20, you know, 20 <laughs> years ago. Yeah. And then in that it's only gotten worse since then. So you know, just this deep conviction that I want to be a part of the solution. The last thing I want to do is be a part of the problem. I don't want to make things worse. So what's the value in being able to to get into that, be able to have the conversations? We so often want to find people who agree with us and support our opinions and make us more certain, not less. Um, yeah. So what's what's the value that you see in actually having these kinds of conversations with people whose opinions are very different than ours? For me, look, if I weren't a Christian, okay, I would be the most opinionated, loud, vocal, pushy person. I, honestly, that's my, it's, uh, you know, kind of how I was socialized and conditioned as a athletic young man uh, to throw my weight around, to show dominance. But once I came to Christ and my heart was uh, strangely warmed, as we say, <laughs> yeah. I started to see that there is a deep and abiding problem in our culture that is so fragmented and fractured. And so for me, the deep conviction is that um, it, it comes out of this passage in, uh, in Corinthians chapter five that says, uh, God reconciled all things to God's self in Christ and then gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And earlier in that passage, it talks about the fact that we've all been adopted into God's family. And so we are God's children and that the spirit testifies in our spirit that we belong. So when I look at somebody else across the table, the first thing I have to realize is that's God's child, right? We're both, we're both adopted into God's family. And so we're both children in God's eyes. So once I see that humanity in them, then I realize that I, have, I am an ambassador of the good news of God's grace and that, that I've been given that responsibility and the ministry of reconciliation. So if God, who is love and perfection of the divine, can reconcile all things to God's self in Christ— and then give us the ministry of reconciliation, we can do better than what we're seeing currently. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a really lofty and cosmic job description. Sure. <laughs> but but it's, not, it's not about winning the day. It's about finding this ministry of bringing people together. Yeah. So the thing is, I love being right. This is my problem. <laughs> okay. I don't know if you're, if you're anything like me. Of course. But, Oh, yeah. But I have figured out that I'd rather be in right relationship than be right. And especially if we create um, a, a web of meaning, to quote uh, Bonnie Miller McLemore, this web of meaning, when you see the church as this interconnected web, that we're all in some way, we're tied in with one another. And so once you stop seeing it as an us versus them issue or a right versus wrong or a good versus bad, mm -hmm. a right versus left, maybe red versus blue. Should I keep going? There's so many <laughs> There's of these, enough, yeah. these, these polarized <laughs> things where we're given these either or options, conservative or liberal, blah, right. blah, blah. <laughs> Once you stop with that and you say that we're all in this together, it really does change the, I will call it the temperature of your heart hmm. to realize that, look, it's not that I'm not allowed to have my conviction on this. I'm allowed to have my opinion. Mm -hmm. It's just that I don't need to either dominate or totally destroy uh, my opponent in an all or nothing, zero sum competition. We're all in this together. So there's nothing that's a hundred and zero. 
Right. Now we might we might not want to split 50-50. Mm-hmm. But this hundred and zero all or nothing thing is just it's it's corrupting us and it's actually drying out our soul a little bit. We're becoming more calloused and more jaded. And it's not good. It's it's not let's call it the fruit of the spirit. I think that I'm pretty confident that when the spirit is at work, here's how you're going to know. There's things like love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and gentleness and self-control. That's how you know the spirit's at work. Mm -hmm. I have heard you say on your podcast, piecing it all together, that one of the ways that we need to learn to disagree better, if that's the right way to say this, is to be willing to remain at the table. Like it's okay to think you're right. It's okay to have the conversation, but to not be dismissive, to be able to stay in the conversation. Can you say more about that? Yes. Oh man. Thank you for bringing that up. That's such a difficult um, proposal because you know, we live in a world where when somebody posts something on Facebook you don't like, you can either mute them or just unfriend them altogether. Yeah. And what that ends up uh, doing is we create an echo chamber, right, where we're mm-hmm. only hearing messages that we already agree with. In the church, we would call that preaching to the choir. Right. <laughs> uh, the danger is when the volume is turned up as loud as it is right now, an echo chamber can actually become a distortion loop where you're getting feedback, where you're only hearing yourself and it actually warps, right? The Mm, sound mm -hmm. you're not, it's not healthy. I'll just say that. So when we talk about staying at the table, one of the really difficult things is to be committed to the person more than their opinion. Mm. And I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, One of my childhood friends, I haven't seen him in 30 years, uh, found me recently on Facebook and, um, he has the 100% opposite opinion about kneeling during the national anthem that I do. Okay. And he is, man, he's upset and he's posting about it on Facebook. Right. You know, and it's, uh, it's not what I want to read in the morning. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't go well with my morning coffee. It doesn't make my morning sweeter. It would be so easy to mute him mm-hmm. or turn him off. Mm-hmm. Staying at the table is saying, I'm not going to unfriend him because I disagree with him. Now, if he becomes hurtful or, you know, whatever, that's a totally different story. But the person who uh, brought this is was Randy Woodley. He's my co-host of the show. He's a Native American theologian who has, for his entire life in ministry, um, had people walk away from the table. Mm. So let's, let's say that they sit down at a conference or a committee meeting. And Randy's asking for something like to be heard or recognized because the person is in a privileged position, they can walk away from the table for one really simple reason, because if nothing changes, they're fine. Right. It's all the system already works in a way that benefits them. Randy trying to represent marginalized or disadvantaged communities needs something to change. So the impetus is on him. He, the weight, the burden of, of, of making this thing work is on him. So his idea was, look, just stay at the table. The luxury of walking away is a luxury not all of us have. So when you feel tempted, if you're uncomfortable, especially when issues of race come up, that's a big one, mm-hmm. or, or issues of sexuality, issues of finances, politics, when we become uncomfortable, it's just, it's easier for us to walk away, but to stay at the table and to be committed. Oh, that is a really tough assignment. But as Christians, we have, we have an assignment. We have an expectation. So in Philippians chapter two, there's this idea, you know, called kenosis that of the self emptying Mm -hmm. of Christ And so it says that we're supposed to have the same mind as that which was in Christ Jesus. And so the impetus is on us because we have been gifted by grace. And so part of our gifting or the way that we can grace the world 
is to commit to stay in difficult conversations, even when they're pressing in on our comfort zone. And so as these ministers of reconciliation, part of the thing is to uh, to do a kenotic or an emptying move of saying, yes, I'm uncomfortable or my blood pressure is up or whatever. But to just lay that aside in um, in favor of the larger picture and the common good. And so staying at the table is probably I mean, the reason we led with it first, it's the first of our three principles. Mm -hmm is it's the toughest. Mm. So you got to put all your initial energy uh, to just remain at the table because the flight, the fight or flight instinct is strong. Yeah. And it's more than just, if I'm hearing you correctly, it's, it's more than just the physical presence or remaining in the conversation, but it kind of goes back to that humility idea that you were talking about earlier and being able to actually hear what the other person is saying and maybe understand the way that they're viewing it rather than just continually saying, this is my perspective, this is my perspective, but actually being able to hear yeah, I, you know, and for those of us who are not um, in marginalized communities or or positions, it really is a, a ministry of love to say, like, for instance, mm -hmm. let's say that because I'm I'm a straight guy, let's say that um, in whatever state you're in or whatever denomination you're in, you know, no matter how it shakes out about uh, same sex marriage or the way forward or whatever it is you know, my marriage is not in danger, right? It's not up for debate. And so I have the luxury of saying, even when I'm flustered and even when I disagree, I'm more committed to the people than I am to the, my opinion. And I'm becoming aware as we're talking that even it's, it's, there's a little bit of irony here in that I can feel my own heart rate kind of accelerating a little bit as we talk about some of these more difficult issues and, yeah. and the fears that people are just gonna shut it off because they assume they know where you or I are coming from on these issues and simply walk away and, and turn us off. And, and you begin to feel that how others can respond and how we can continue to have the conversation. I, I'm really curious how this happens within the faith context. You've started to touch on that a, a little bit, but, but I imagine not everybody in your church agrees on every conversation that you have during a worship service. How does that play out? Because a lot of times I hear people, you know, they resort to an authority, whether it's scripture or tradition or whatever that is, and say, this is the thing that's, you know, this is it. This, and we have to agree with this. How do you see that playing out differently? Well, there, I think we have two advantages. One is, you know, as, as Methodists, we have this thing called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. That is a mouthful sometimes. <laughs> uh, and so we start with scripture and then we look to the tradition we look to our experience and then to reason that sequence provides the raw material and the the rubric or the the scheme that we need a, it's let's say I call it a tool mm -hmm. that we need for communal discernment and because with that wesleyan quad we don't have a, a knockout blow with scripture we don't have the trump card with our experience right. By, by, by partnering those four together, we have a very balanced and holistic way to proceed as a community when we don't agree. I love it. I think that it is, it is tailor-made for the 21st century. Hmm. Is that something that you draw on as you're having these conversations within your community? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I actually think, so what I do is I teach the quad fairly often in Sunday school. I'll okay. refer, like, if, no matter what the topic is, I'll reference it and we'll run it through the grid, right? And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to train my conversation leaders so that when we go upstairs for the service and mm -hmm. we're in our worship gathering, that I know that there's 20 people in the room who know about the quad and can employ it and that we've practiced together right. on, on issues, right? right? And so I can trust that for the most part, when people are in their conversation groups of four to five, that there's going to probably be somebody in there who can, you know, bring some perspective as far as these four things that we call the quad and be a voice of reconciliation and moderation when there are really strong opinions present. Teach me more about 
how this works in your church. What would it be like for me to show up on a Sunday morning? How is it different than the church I might attend? Yes. Okay. Now this is where the rubber meets the road. (laughs) So what we've done is we've taken the basic form of liturgy that most Methodists would be familiar with, and we've kept that as the shell, but we've done some renovation within the gathering about how we spend our time together. So I have decentered the sermon. Instead of the sermon being uh, the main event, Mm -hmm. I actually usually have it up in the the first third of the gathering as sort of a catalyst or a idea. So I'll do like an eight minute homily, like a TED talk. It might go as long as 10 or 12 minutes. That would be long. Okay. To just introduce an idea. And then usually twice during an hour long gathering, we're going to break up into our smaller groups of, of three to four or five. I try and keep them small so that everybody can get a chance to talk if they want to. And not, not everybody wants to talk, you know, about every subject. And so we'll, we'll have a range of topics. So for instance, sometimes like with the first week of Advent, I always break people into conversation groups at the very beginning of the gathering and say, what's your favorite Christmas movie? Right. It's just it's just an icebreaker because I know in this in the second half of the gathering, I'm going to ask them to go back to that same group and talk about the sermon. Okay, right. So that might be a way that we pair the questions. But sometimes I'll put the questions before the sermon or the the homily. So a couple of weeks ago, I, I asked a really personal question. I said, now, not everybody has to answer this, but if you've ever, ever forgiven somebody for something, what was the hardest part of forgiving. And then I let them talk for five or six minutes. And then I recentered them into, you know, I'm standing in the middle of the, the, the worship space. And I just go around the room and I just say, Hey, anybody in this section that want to volunteer what your conversation sounded like? And then I take what they said is the most difficult parts of forgiveness. And, you know, I've like loosely planned my homily, mm-hmm. but I also let their conversation inform uh, my sermon. Wow. And I respond to that. And so um, that's a dangerous thing that I do because I know I'm pretty fast on my feet and uh, can integrate that stuff. But it's a it's dialogical. It's a dialogue. Mm-hmm. It's a conversational space. And so we will, you know, do all the way from really shallow things, um, you know, just regular icebreakers that you would do with any group, all the way to my favorite one is after the sermon or the homily, I'll say, break up into your you know, smaller groups and talk about what you heard, what resonated with you. What would you like to talk more about? Hmm. Then I let, sometimes I let them tell me what that is, yeah. but other times, you know, I'll say, let's talk about this over at coffee hour or whatever. So we range all the way from shallow to deep, from conceptual kind of abstract stuff to really uh, practical stuff. But we always try and account for two different people one is the new the visitor because we know that you know that may not be comfortable for them initially sure although the surprising part is and and i when i started this down in los angeles at uh, westwood united methodist for the loft la and i'm finding it up here as well people who come to church have already looked at your website and they know what they're (laughs) coming to yeah they're fine and they came because they wanted to be a part of the conversation. Mm. So we're really careful with visitors, although most of the time we don't need to be. But the other person is uh, maybe somebody who's a little shy or introverted. So we have to build in um, time because not everybody is ready to respond the minute they hear a question. So that those are the really positive things that I've seen. Sure. The only negative thing I've seen is when somebody has watched a lot of 24 hour news in a week (laughs) and has memorized the talking points and comes with an agenda, that honestly is the only thing. But if you have built a a culture of of listening uh, and, and of grace, a people of grace, usually somebody in the group will be able to say like, hey, Joe, I know you're really passionate about this, but maybe it's it would be good for us to hear from a couple other people. Or they'll somehow manage it. Or maybe the person sitting next to them will kind of squeeze their arm and let them know like, yeah, we get it, buddy. You're <laughs> really opinionated on this. But other than that, uh, and I've been doing this for six years now, wow. I, I've only had two gatherings where something happened that I wish had it. So 
that's actually better than my sermons. I mean, back when I used to do long <laughs> sermons, uh, I didn't have that good of a ratio back then. <laughs> <laughs> like that a lot. The final question that I ask everybody on Get Your Spirit in Shape is that you've offered us a lot of lot to think about, um, but I also like to hear some of the exercises, some of the ways that, things that you do to help keep your own spirit in shape. So what would you recommend somebody try to help keep them close to God? Draw bell curves. <laughs> okay, you got to tell me more than that. <laughs> <laughs> because we have been sold and are daily... Uh, put forward with these polarized either or options, mm -hmm. you have to draw bell curves because the reality is that most of the opinions you hear are going to be in the little tail at the end or that, that lead head front, but that the majority of people, the big belly of the population is going to fall somewhere in the middle. And so like, for instance, you know, we get proposed red States and blue States, mm -hmm. but if you draw a bell curve, you'll see that actually the majority, the large majority of people who were eligible to vote didn't. Oh, right. So as, as polarized as these two camps seem to be, actually the big belly of people didn't even participate. So it's just good in a polarized either or society to draw bell curves and to say, who's the big group in the middle? Because it brings some balance to the situation and you think like, you know, I know the people at the tail end and the people in the lead head are really loud, but they don't really represent or account for most of us. So I draw bell curves and see who am I not hearing from? Yeah. And, and I just keep coming. I, I just keep hearing you say, and maybe this is what's going on in my head, but I just keep hearing you say to be able to step out a little bit from your own opinions and to be able to actually listen and hear the things that are going on around you. I, I'm going to take that with me as that to me is, is just really profound and an important piece that we all oh. need to learn. And, uh, uh, Bo, I, I just thank you so much for, uh, for all that you're doing. I appreciate your, your blog and your podcast, uh, piecing it all together, which we will put links to on the episode thank page you. so that people can find you and learn more about you and your ministry and, and hopefully learn more about, uh, Vermont Hills United Methodist Church and all the ministry that's, that's going on there. Thanks, Bo. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity and I like how, um, civil and, uh, and, and <laughs> <laughs> pleasant this exchange was. It was, it was great. We modeled it well. It's really not that hard, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That was the Reverend Bo Sanders, a United Methodist pastor, blogger, and the co-host of a podcast called Piecing It All Together, P-E-A-C-I-N-G, It All Together. To learn more about Bo and the Vermont Hills United Methodist Church in Portland, Oregon, go to umc.org slash podcasts and look for this episode. We've put a several links on the page to, for you to explore. And while you're there, feel free to email me about what you like about Get Your Spirit in Shape or any suggestions you have for, for future episodes. And if you have time, go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. Good reviews really do help people find us. Well, that's it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening and downloading and subscribing to Get Your Spirit in Shape. And I'll be back soon with another conversation to help us keep our souls as healthy as our bodies. I'm Joy Avino. Peace.